Okay, so tonight we're getting loopy. We're talking about loops. And um, to relate this to last week, last week we learned about how to get our Python script to make a decision. And those decisions are really true-false questions. And tonight we're going to expand on that concept. But we're going, what we're going to do is take the ability to have our true-false questions and our code in the local scope, and we're going to do it repeatedly. Because remember when I said computers are stupid, but they do a lot of things really, really, really fast? Well, this is one of the ways they're really, really, really fast, is that you put something in a loop and you let it make the decisions as you go. So all your input, when you're playing those games or Using Microsoft Word, all that input is getting processed through a loop. So, but we're going to start out with code reusability. Code reusability is my favorite topic in programming. I know, I'm a little odd. But what is reusability? So, it's not copying and pasting your code. What it is, is it is using functions and loops and objects to make your code reusable. Um, I don't want to write too much code. And the general formula is, if you catch a bug in requirements, it costs you a dollar. If you catch it in design, it costs you $10. If you catch it in development, it costs you $100. And if you, your customer catches it, it costs you 1000 and that's just a general order of magnitude that you see in the industry. Also, somebody's paying for my time as a developer. I'm not out there writing the next great game, but even if I were and I were self-employed, it's still my time. So I want to be as effective and efficient as I can in my job for two reasons. I love writing code, but I don't like writing the same code over and over again. And it makes it easier to maintain. All code has to be maintained. Very few times do you write it and it runs for a century. New technology comes out, new requirements come out, things change. So we have to be able to go back in and maintain our code. I want to write as few lines of code as possible so that I have to maintain less code. So it's easier for me to go back in and when a requirement changes, make the change in a manner that is reusable. So tonight we're going to talk about loops. And loops are the way we're going to do reusability. Um, so we have some keywords and descriptions. So we're going to have two different types of loop keywords. There's while and there's for. And each of them have, they, they can overlap, but each of them have kind of a distinctive uh, use when you're programming. There is in, which is used along with for, and it checks the value of a sequence in a loop. And we'll get to what that is. There's handy dandy brake, which is like put your brakes on, turn the car off, because you're done. So it will stop the uh, execution of the loop and it will go outside the loop to the next thing that's in the either global scope or the scope outside of that loop. And continue is like, okay, stop here, but go back. Go back to the top of the loop and try it again. So those are the main keywords, the new keywords that we're dealing with this week. Okay, so we have some new concepts too. We have the concept of an iteration. And an iteration is walking through, is Python executing the code in the local scope of the loop. So it'll execute each one of those statements, and it'll decide if it's going to go back up to the top of the loop, if it's going to continue, if it's just done, if you're breaking. And for while loops, we have something called a sentinel value. And that's the value that determines when the loop stops. And that's important because you're going to need that for your game. So the basics of a while loop. So first of all, we, we're going to start off with a variable. And that variable is going to be outside of the scope of 
the while loop. So what you have here is we have a variable. You know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And um, that variable equals something. Right now it's equal to go. It almost doesn't matter. Then I have the while, key, the while keyword. And while is an indication to Python that it's going to have to make decisions repeatedly. Now this is still a true false test. So it's going to say test is, so the, the, the way this reads is test is not equal to the letter Q, true or false. So that's what that, that's what, how you read that. It's read just like an if statement, except you're going to keep doing it again and again and again, which is where the while comes in. And then we have stuff in the middle, uh, in the local scope. So the first thing I have to ask is, does test equal Q? Or, you know, does go, is go not equal to Q? Well, true. Go is not equal to Q. And because it's true, just like we had with the if statements, true, you do the stuff inside the local scope. False, you don't. So this test is true. And I can then do what's in the local scope. So other than the while statement, it looks pretty much like an if statement. I have a conditional operator. And I have the thing that I'm going to test on the right-hand side of the conditional operator. That is the sentinel value. The sentinel value says stop. Don't go into the local scope anymore. Just don't. Um, and again, this is read just like an if statement. It's the true-false question. And then we have the stuff in the local scope. And the stuff in the scope is only going to be executed while test is not equal to Q. So there's three tests here that are outlined. And that's because they're all the same. They, you have to use the sentinel value. Sorry, you have to use the variable, the, the variable that you are um, testing inside the while loop to change the value. Otherwise, it's going to run forever. So this is very specific to while loops, that the thing that changes your test variable needs to be inside the while loop. And uh, that's a problem that a lot of students run into, especially when they try while loops. They have that, we're all used to making that input statement outside of our if statements. Now we have to put it inside for a while loop. Now, also, why is the while loop important to you guys specifically? It's important because you're going to be asked to write a game loop for your game. This is the game loop. This is how you start it. You're going to have a value. could be called test. could be called Fred. You're going to have a while loop with a sentinel value. Specifically, the rubric says you have to be able to quit out of this program. So you can decide if it's Q. You can decide if it's the word quit. But you have to be able to allow the user to exit your program. And this is how you do it. You make sure that input is, on the, is in the local scope of the while loop. And that you're setting the value of the variable that you're using for the test in the while loop to do that. So if you're taking notes, if you're going to go back and watch this, this is the beginning of your gameplay loop. OK, a few rules. Sentinel is a value which defines the exit condition from the loop. In our case, it's Q. A while loop will execute and then until the Sentinel value reaches the exit condition. That's very important because you guys might get a timeout error in Zybooks when you're doing this. If you're getting a timeout, that means your loop is running infinitely and there's something wrong. You're not modifying the same variable in the while as in as that inside, uh, sorry, as in the local scope. Um, a while statement must end with a colon. Got to remember the colon, just like an if. 
Um, so let's go follow the test. We're going to keep going with this. So the test is go, sorry, test is go, which is not the same as Q. So we're going to print input, your input is, and then it's going to test. So this is what it does before a user inputs anything. Because I set the test variable to something other than the Sentinel value. So the Sentinel value is Q. I've set test to go. Go is not Q, which is true. So I'm going to then execute those two lines of code just, from, just by starting the program. Now here's the important part. When I get to this input statement, I'm going to input something and that is going to change the test value. So test is no longer go. The first iteration is complete. I've come back up to the top of the loop. I've changed the value of test to hello. And then what happens? What happens is Python evaluates it and says hello is not the same as Q, true. So I go back inside the local scope. I go back inside the while loop. I'm going to print out your input is whatever it is. And then I'm going to stop because I'm asking for input from the user. So now handy dandy Professor Lisa here enters Q. So the second iteration is now complete. And so what Python is going to do is it's going to say test is now Q. Q is not equal to Q, and that's false. So it's not going to go inside of the loop. It's not going to end up in that local scope, and it's going to stop running the loop. So that's kind of how you have to think about it, and you have to think about this as iterations. As Python is walking through that local scope, the code in that local scope, and it's good. you've got to change stuff so that when it goes back up to that while statement, it has something to evaluate. Okay, and I'm going to say this a couple times. Each trip through the while loop or any loop is called an iteration. So here's a quick flow chart for that loop. And I do this because it's visually, I think it, it helps people visually understand what's going on. And it's also language agnostic. And if you decide you needed to do a flowchart with a loop in it, this is how you do it. So what I have here is just the general flowchart. I have start, I've set my test variable equal to go. You'll notice there's no while in that diamond. It is an if condition because I'm asking a question. The loop comes in and what happens if it's true and what happens if it's false. If you look to true, you see I'm going to output what test is. I'm going to ask for input again, and then I'm going to go back up to the same if statement. That is the loop. So we're going to follow the loop again. So real quickly, I put in hello. Hello is not the same as Q, which is true. I'm going to output hello, and now I'm going to input something again. I'm going to input Q. It's going to go up to the diamond. Q is Q which is false because test, sorry, Q is not equal to Q is false. Oh, sorry. And we're done. So counting with while, actually, let me go out and do the simple while loop. Does anybody have any questions? No. Okay. Um, let's see how this works in PyCharm. So this is just a simple while loop. That's all it is. Uh, where's simple while? OK. I'll be able to read one day. All right. So what do I have here? I have two variables. And I'm just going to um, um, input a character and then I'm going to print out I'm going to I'm going to keep upping the power by 2 and then I'm going to be done. So, oh, there we go. As we all know, I have a thing for the debugger, so we're going to walk through this line by line, okay? Now you'll also notice here that I have this line 9, 
We didn't see that in the slides. But line 9 basically is just something else in the global scope. Just like while is in the global scope, and curb power equal to, and user care equal y, they're all in the global scope, and so is this while statement. However, this 5, 6, and 7 is in the local scope. It only executes if user care is the same as Y. You'll also notice that in the, in the um, PowerPoint, or sorry, not PowerPoint, Keynote presentation, I had not equal to Q. It's just a conditional. So in this case, I'm just using the double equal sign is equivalent. So let's run through this really quick. And I am going to, here, we'll go to frames and variables, variables. So I've defined curve power. I've defined um, user care is Y. So user care, user care is the same as Y, true or false. Right now it's true, and because it's true, I'm going to go into the local scope. So I'm going to increase by a power of 2, and then I'm going to print it out here on the console, and then I'm going to ask for user input. So it's waiting for user input. I'm going to say Y. So user care is Y because I set it down here in that input statement. I'm going to go now. I've gone back to the top of the while loop. It is evaluating it, and user care is Y, so it's going to go into the local scope. I'm now going to print out my curve power. I'm going to ask for user input, and now I'm done. So I'm just going to say Q. Hit the enter key and back up at the top of the while loop. Q is not the same as Y. So that means it's not going to go into the loop. It's not going to go into that local scope. So when I step over, I'm now on line 9. Why did I end up on line 9? I ended up on line 9 because that is the next uh, line of code in the global scope. And when I am done with the while, it's going to fall out to the next line that is in the same scope as the while. In this case, it's the global scope. And then I'm done. And it prints done. So that is a simple while. And as always, all these scripts will be up on, uh, on the YouTube channel tomorrow. So counting with while. Why is it important to count? Well. Because sometimes you only want to do things a certain number of times. You don't care about the user input. You care that it's only going to happen three times. Or it's only going to happen five times. Now, we're going to talk about counting with a while loop, but I use for loops for counting because they're just better. Uh, and we will go look at why in a few minutes. But it's important to know that you can also count with a while loop. So, just like we had before, I have counter equals zero. So counter is my variable. That's the variable that I'm going to test in the while loop. That's the variable that I'm going to modify. So that's my test variable. I have a sentinel value. Um, I'm going into the while loop. I'm printing counter is. Now here, I'm not asking user for input. I am incrementing the counter by one. So I go, I have one, I go two, I go three, because I'm just doing counter plus one each time. When counter less than three evaluates to false, which means it's three, I'm done. So that was, sorry, that was counting with while. And it's very simple. It's four lines of code. We can do it more efficiently. This is a for loop. Okay? For loops were meant for counting. While loops were meant for things where you needed user input to specifically change the outcome of the loop, like your game. For loops are uh, very handy, and they are used for collections, and they are used for counting. In fact, they're special 
functions that Python gives you just to make the counting easier. So I have four. Four is my keyword. And I and tells Python you're going to make a decision repeatedly. I have a variable. And it's num. Could have been Fred. This variable is defined in the local scope of that for loop. You'll notice that there's no definition outside for num, like I had for test. And that's because it doesn't need to be. I don't need to define a variable outside of the for loop. I don't have to define anything in the global scope. I get to define it in the same line as the for keyword. And it's a variable that only exists for the time that that for loop is running. And then we have another new keyword, and it's in. In says expect a sequence. So I have for, which is telling Python it's going to make a decision again and again and again. And then I have the variable that it's going to look at. And then I have in, which says on the right-hand side, there is going to be a sequence. A sequence of numbers, a sequence of characters, a sequence of rooms, a sequence of directions, a sequence. And what I'm going to use is a range function. Now, range is a very handy function, and we're going to go through it in a little more detail. But basically what it does is it creates an array of numbers for you. And in this case, I'm telling it to create a range of three numbers, starting at 0, ending at 2. So it would be 0, 1, and 2. And, um, and the way you read this statement is, num is less than 3 because I'm only going to do 0, 1, and 2 because just like strings, lists start at 0. And so there, if there are three elements in a list, that is three elements or three numbers in a list created by range, it would be 0, 1, and 2. So what does the rest of this counting look like? That's what it looks like right there, will only be executed if num is less than 3. So that's what's in the local scope. And that's it, two lines of code as opposed to four. And it's significantly simpler to manage these two lines of code than it is when you have a large, large while loop. The drawback is you're only going to run through this three times. The user has nothing to say about this. You can't go ahead and change num or change the amount of things in the range. So you're just going to have to go through it three times, or 10 times, or 15, or however many you've decided is the maximum number of times. So this is the anatomy of a for loop. You, lose, you use for loops for numbering and for iterating over collections. And range is a special function. Um, Num is that special variable that is really in the local scope of the for loop. Um, you got to make sure it ends with a colon. Colons can be the bane of people's existence in Python. But if you remember it, you'll be good. And I'll show you what it means if you don't. OK, so range, range and in. So what I had in the previous slide was for num in range of 3. That's it, those two lines of code. So what does in do? It's used for two purposes. It determines if the value is contained in the sequence, created by range, and it's often used to iterate through any other sequence. Range is a function that is provided by Python. You just get it. And it has three potential arguments, start, stop, and increment. Now start and stop are optional, which means they don't have to be there. You can simply put the stop in, which is what we did in the previous slide. But there are, there's at least one lab where you're going to have to increment, I believe, more than one, because the in default increment is one. So every time you get to the top of the loop, it's going to go and add one to what it, so the value of num from the previous iteration. Um, so that's what range is, and it's, it's very handy. You can use it quite often. 
Now, so let's follow the num. So there's no teacher needed. I'm just superfluous. So what's going to happen here? I have range of 3, which is 0, 1, and 2. That's exactly what it's going to create. It's going to create a list with the number 0, 1, and 2 in it. So 0 is num. I'm going to print num is 0. I go back up to the top of the loop. So now I'm pulling one off that list. I'm going to print num is 1. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. Now I'm pulling 2. I'm going to say num is 2. And I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And because I have just done 3, Python's going to say done. That's it. It's all that has to happen. So we're going to use flowchart here just quickly to show you that for loops and while loops are identical in a flowchart. And they will be identical in your, in your pseudocode. So we have if num is less than 3, we're going to output num if that's true. We're going to count up. And, that, and when that is no longer true, we're going to end. So you will see that a for loop and a while loop look the same on a flowchart. So um, a little more about range. I'm going to print every other number between 1 and 5 inclusive. That means I want to start at 1 and end at 5. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to have 4 num in range, and now I've, just, I've added some more things to range. What have I done? I've said starting at 1, ending at 6, which is 5 minus 1. So that end is always one more than what you want because you have to um, range. So range is going to say it's almost like a less than. Um, and then you're going to increment by 2. That's what that far right one is. So I'm going to have ranges with that setup is going to create me an array, 1, 3, and 5. And I'm going to go back here, num. I'm going to print num is. Now num is 1, 3, and 5. So that's how you control what the for loop, when it comes to a range, what the for loop is looking for. So if you're trying to only do odd numbers or if you're trying to only do even numbers, you could have said, you know, starting at 0, ending at 5, and 2 would have skipped and it would have been even. So that's a little bit more about range. And that's done. So we're not going to talk about nested loops. We're going to look at some programs. And does anybody have any questions? Okay. So we're going to look at for with range. Okay. So here's my for with range. And it's just going to be like we saw in, um, in the slide. Hold on. Let me do this. Forward range. Okay. So I'm just going to debug this because we all know how much I like the debugger. So you'll notice here down in the lower left that there is no variable called counter yet. While, with the while loop, we had to define the variable first so it existed. However, it, this will, that variable will only be created once I have gone into the local scope of a while loop. So if I step over, you'll see counter is created and it is 0 because range has told it that its first number is 0. And I'm going to print it. And then I'm up to the top of the loop. And range is going to now say, OK, counter, your value is 1. I'm just going to print 1. And now it's going to say your value is 2. And it's just going to print 2. 
And then here it's going to say, okay, you don't have any more values. So the for loop is going to exit. So that's how, and it's very, very handy. Now, I'm also going kind of fast through the basics because we want to talk about nested loops because those are a big thing. And I do want to take enough time to go over the, um, the labs for this week. So you can nest loops. What does that mean? Well, that means that a loop is inside the local scope of another loop. And you can nest loops as many times as you want. Um, so what do we have here? Um, and this is challenge 4.13. 4.1.3. It says, given the number of rows and the number of columns, write nested loops to print a rectangle. And this is similar to what you're going to have to do in a lab this week. So I'm going to start out with rows. It's just I'm asking for the user to give me some number of rows. It could be two, it could be five, it could be one. And then I'm going to say put the number of columns. So I'm drawing a box. So I have some number of rows and some number of columns. And that's something very important to understand with nested loops, especially nested for loops. You are going to create what, for all intents and purposes, is a spreadsheet with rows and columns. If you think about it like a spreadsheet with rows and columns, it won't be as, as mysterious. Because that's what you're doing. You're creating a matrix. You're just doing it in a programming language. Um, and so I have the for loop, and I've, my variable, I've just called it outer. And then I have a for loop inside that outer for loop with an inner, and I've got range of rows and range of columns. And I'm going to print star, and I'm going to end with a space because I don't want a new line. And that's how you end with a space. And then when I'm done with the row with the columns, I'm going to print a new line and then go back up to the top of the outer loop. So let's take a look. So handy dandy Professor Lisa here says there are going to be two rows and two columns. So over on the right hand side of this, you'll see start outer is zero. So the outer down here, because it's going to be four outer in range rows. So range is going to create zero and one. That's going to be its collection. When outer is basically less than rows, I'm going to go inside that for loop. And I'm going to just go into the local scope. And inside the local scope is four, another for loop with inner in range of columns. I have two columns. So range here is going to give me 0 and 1. So I've now started the inner at 0. So outer is 0 and inner is 0. Now I'm going to print out a star with a space. And now I'm going to go back up to that inner for loop because I have not finished that inner for loop. The only way I get back to the outer for loop is break, sorry, is continue, or is to finish the inner loop. So I go back up. If you look over to the right, it's inner equals 0 plus 1 is 1. So I've done one iteration through the inner loop. Now I go back and I print another star. And I go back up to the top of the loop. So I've got 0 and 1. Now I finish the second iteration. I have 1 plus 1 equals 2. At that moment, I'm going to be done with the inner loop. So I go outside, so the inner loop is done, and I'm going to go to the next line in the same scope as the inner for loop. And I hope I'm not speaking gibberish, because I know this can get complex. So the next line in the same scope as the inner for loop is print. And that is there, so I can have a new line. And so I'm done now with all of the local scope the first time, because outer is still 0. It hasn't changed. So all of that goes away. 
And now outer is 0 plus 1, which is 1. And inner goes back to 0. It's as if inner had never run before. And that's another concept that kind of can throw people off at first. If they, they think that inner is still at 2, but inner in this case won't be at 2 until it starts again. So we're starting for inner in range columns again. It's like it never ran. So I'm now going to print another star. This is going to be in the second row. Same thing happens when I'm done and it prints another star. And then I go and I'm done with the second iteration of the inner loop. I then print. I go now back to the outer loop. And the outer loop is going to say 2 and I'm done. So that is what a nested loop is. And this is very similar to a challenge you're going to have, or to a lab you're going to have to do this week. So let's go and do a lab. Sorry, do, um, hold on. There we go. Um, nested four. All right. So. Input a number, input another number, and then we're just going to run through these two loops. And let me add this here, just to make it easier. Print done. OK. So what I have here is just two input statements. I'm going to input another. I'm going to input another number. So I'm going to have, I have my outer for loop and my inner for loop. And I've just got some extra print statements, um, finished inner, that's the inner iteration. Um, sorry. Um, so this is very similar to what we did, but I want to be able to walk through it in the code. So this is nested four. All right, yeah. Nested four. And I'm just going to debug this. So I'm going to ask for my two values. So I'm going to say val one is three. Whoops. Let's step over that first. Input a number. That number is going to be three. I'm going to step over it and put another number, 3. OK, so now I'm here in the for loop. Let's look at our frames and variables. Currently, there's nothing because, uh, hold on, variables. There's val1 and val2. Now I'm about to walk into the local, local scope of the for loop. So first thing I'm just going to do is, print the number for outer. So in this case, outer is 0, which is fine. And I'm now going to go into the for loop for, I'm going to go into the inner for loop. So I'm going to say inner in range 0 to val2, because I just want to make sure it starts at 0. So I'm going to step over. So I have inner and outer are both 0. And now I'm going to print inner with a space. So if I look at inner, I have 0. Then I'm still in the local scope of the outer for loop. And I'm going to evaluate the inner for loop again for the next number. So in this case, the inner is now 1 because range has told it it's 1. and I'm going to then go again. I'm now back up at the top of the inner for loop. And range has told inner that its value is now 2. And so I have 0, 1, and 2. And now I finished the loop. All right? So I am now done with the inner loop completely. And I'm going to go up to the outer loop again. And so range is going to tell outer 
that it is um, now 1, and so it's going to do this all again. So I'm just going to make it look a little prettier, and we can just run it and see what the output looks like. So I'm going to input a number 3, and I'm going to input a number 4. And so this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, done. So it prints that three times because I said the input of the top number was 3. And it input 0, 1, 2, 3 because I've told it 4. So let's actually do this. Let's make it look a little neater. And we'll run it again. Okay, so I'm going to do 4 here, and I'm going to do 3 here, and that's what you see, okay? Rows and columns. If you think about rows and columns with nested for loops, things will be easier. So I want to show you an index out of bounds. Oh, that's a list. So we haven't gotten there yet. Um, I, let, let me go in for the nested for loop. And, and create some havoc. So let me just take off that colon and run this again. So I'm going to say syntax error invalid syntax. So it's telling me about the colon. So now let's do this and see what happens. See how it differs. Let's just do 3 and 3. And it didn't differ which is interesting, but that works because this variable outer is only available in this local scope, and this variable outer is only available in this local scope. So it's like you can have two variables of the same name, but it's because of their scope. But I don't want you guys to get confused when it comes to scope, so it's always better in your for loops and your while loops, especially when they're nested, to use completely separate variables. It will work if you don't do that, but there are other things that may get messed up. There are calculations and things that could get messed up. Hi, Randy. Could you please mute? Okay, so break. Break is stop and stop right now. And it's important because sometimes you don't want a loop to run to the end. Sometimes you want to say while true and then just give it a break on the inside. There are things that are very very uh, that like timers when you're starting to deal with things like timers and threads you're going to want to tell them when to stop they're going to run forever until you say stop so that's really what a break is so I just have a variable test I have a while loop while it's not done I'm going to input 42 and I'm going to say, if time in test, then you don't have a clock. And I didn't, the, the word time was not in the variable test. And then if 42 in test, print right answer and break. Else, and I don't need to do that because it's done. So that is, sorry. That is how you do a break. I ended up doing a conditional statement to see if test 42 was in the variable test. And in can be used in a string because a string is just a sequence. It's a list. A special list, but a list. Um, and then I can output something, and then I can tell it to stop. So this is a way to stop the execution of your loop. For instance, if you are in your gameplay loop and you say, you know, what do you want to do? And I say quit, you're going to put a break in. You're going to say, if the answer is quit, 
colon break. So that's what a break is used for, and that's why it's important for you because in your gameplay loop, you're going to have to give me the option to stop it. And I do test for that. And so let's keep going. Continue is similar, okay? Continue, but what continue does is it says don't do anything else, go up to the top of the loop and do it again. So here I'm just doing some string. I'm going to say split string by space, and I am going to have one and two and three. So that's what the split does for me. I've just created a sequence from a string, and now I'm going to do a four, and this is four item in my list. My list, as we can see, has one comma and two comma and three. So I only want to print... Um, I don't want to print and. I want to print anything else, but I don't want to print the word and. So what do I do? Well, inside my for loop, as I am iterating over the list, over my list, and I'm I, they're going into a variable called item, what I'm going to do is item is 1, which means it's not and, and so I'm going to fall into the local scope of the else, and I'm going to print item with a comma. So now I get and. So item is now and. I go inside the for loop, and I'm going to continue because I don't want to print and, and that's what continue does. So now I'm at 2. Same thing happens. I'm going to print 2. Now I've got AND again. Don't want to print AND. So I'm going to continue. And now I've got 3. Item is now 3. And I'm going to print it. And then I'm done. So these are the labs. And this week, we're, all, we're going to look at some flowcharts, but I think we're also going to look at the pseudocode. Hold on. Did I have the pseudocode in here, too? I do not. Why do I have that in there? So we'll look at the pseudocode as well. I'll just pull it up separately. Um, first of all, let me look. I'm trying to not yet. I'm going to just go over the lab and then um, and then open it up for questions. So given the line of text as input, output the number of characters including spaces, periods, or commas. So here's a classic loop. And because I'm dealing with a string, which is a sequence, I can probably safely use a for loop, a for in. So I'm going to have somebody input the string. I'm going to have a counter equals zero because I don't want to go past the last character. But remember, flowcharts are language agnostic. So if I use a for, if I'm thinking about this from a Python perspective, I probably don't need to set a counter outside of the for loop because it's going to do it for me because I'm using a sequence. So I'm just going to say, like we had with the continue, I'm just going to say, give me the next thing in the, the list, and a string is a list. So I'm going to say, if length is less than the length of the string, then I'm going to say, um, if it's not equal to space, and it's not equal to dot, and it's not equal to comma, then I can output, I, I can increment my counter. If it is any of those, I'm going to go back up to my conditional, in this case probably a 4, and I'm going to go back and do it again. For every single character in that string, I'm going to go through this loop. And when I'm all done, I'm going to output the counter. That means the output of the counter has to be in the global scope not in the local scope of the lab. Um, yeah, we're just going to 
sorry about this one. We're just going to – I'll stop. We're just going to go look at the pseudocode for this one. Actually, we can look at it a little bit here. Um, so this is similar to the last one, but different because we're replacing things. Um, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to input a word, we're going to input, we're going to have counter equals zero, and we're going to have password. Now in this case, even if this is a for loop, the password variable has to be defined outside of the for loop because later on it's going to be used in the global scope. It's going to be used someplace other than the local scope of the for loop. And what we're going to do here is we're going to create a couple of new passwords. We're going to create, um, we're going to go through and we're going to replace things. Okay? And we're going to place, you know, the word, if, if, the, neck, if the character in the word is a lowercase m, we're going to set it up as a, an uppercase m. If it's the letter B, we're going to replace it with 8. And we're just going to keep adding on to this new password until we have what Python wants us to have, what this lab wants us to have. And then at the end, we're going to add a Q star S to the password. So this is just one loop with a lot of if statements. Okay? And my suggestion is that in this case, because you're dealing with a string and you're creating another string, that you use a for loop. And each of the conditions inside the for loop in the local scope is going to just be checking that individual character. And you can get the individual character using for and in because you're dealing with a string. And a string is a sequence. So for my variable, in will work. And if you want to, we can go through a really quick example of that. Um, so this is the one that's very much like that um, rectangle one. So you're going to have nested loops on this one. And you're going to create a, tri a right triangle based on the user-specific height and symbol. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to start with, let's say you pick a star. And um, you basically, on the first row is going to be one star, and the second row is going to be two star, and the third row is going to be three stars, and however many, because the user is going to input the triangle height. So that's what you have to do. You have to understand that you're not going to print all the rows, everything in all the rows, like we did in the example when we had nested for loops. You're going to print incrementally. So that's the challenge here. But basically what you're doing is you've got a loop. So if the counter, if counter is less than height, then you're, going to, um, then you're going to increment your variable. And if counter inner is less than counter, you're going to go through and um, output a character and then you're going to say enter and enter plus one. So you're going to do that. And then when it's false, you're going to increment the counter for the outer loop. And you're going to go up to the top again. And we'll look at the pseudocode because I think it's a little easier to see than this. And so I'll bring that up. Um, so this one, there's outputs here as per Zybook. So just there's Zybook gives you a very specific output. And basically what you're doing is you're going to input some words, you're going to split it, and um, you're going to then print it out in this specific format. And you're going to keep doing that until items of zero is quit. Well, we know that when we want user input to stop a loop, that it's probably a good idea to use a while loop and have the sentinel value of quit for that while loop. So let me go open up the pseudocode really quick. Um, so we'll do this one first. OK, so this is 4.14. And what you'll see here is I'm going to input the first 
set user text as input the first number, and then I've got a count. So for each, inside for each, minus one index. So for each character in user text, if character is not equal to a space or a period or a comma, then we're going to set character count equal character plus one inside for each and if to indents. So what I'm telling you here is the number of indents, because that's something I don't think I stressed really well. When you have an if statement or a nested loop, you still have to indent it properly. And let me show you what happens if you don't, real quick. So this is my for loop. So let's say I don't have this indented properly. Well, first of all, Python isn't going to like me very much, and it's going to say indentation area expected and indented block. And it's going to tell me here. And what it's telling me is that I'm not indented properly. So now I can do that. However, let's just do this. So if I run this program again, I'm going to input 2, and I'm going to input 2, and I get I should be inside the inner loop after 0 and 1. And that's because it's not indented properly. If I indent it, what's going to happen is we'll just do 2 and 2. Then I get this particular output. So you have to be careful when you, when you are inside the inner loop or the outer loop because if, let's say I, I put this inside the inner for loop and I ran it and nothing comes out right. It doesn't come out in rows and columns, it just comes out as one big column. And that is an error I've seen sometimes when people do the triangle problem. They don't get things inside the correct loop. So if you are thinking about that problem, you've got an outer and an inner loop, and then you have to make sure right the last thing you do before you go back up to the top of the outer loop is to print a new line, and that's how you do it. So, okay, let's go to the next one, 4.15. And again, all this will be up on the YouTube channel. So I'm going to input a word. I'm going to create a um, password equal empty, and then I'm going to have a character. So in this case, while character count is less than the length of the word, and I could also do this with a for loop. I don't know why I put a while there. Um, so I'm, I'm using word just like we, had, we used in... Um, Module 2, how you access an individual letter. So word of care count, because that's what we want. We want word at where we are in the position is equal to I. Then we set password is equal to exclamation point. And these are all the conditions down here. And remember the else. The else basically says, OK, none of those conditions were true, so just append the character as it is to the password. The last thing you do is you append the Q star S, and then you're going to output the password. So this is not a nested loop. This is a single loop, but it's got a lot of conditions in it. So be very careful about your indenting and about if, and, and it, it's got to be if, elif, elif, all of that. So that has to be correct, or it won't work. Okay, so here is 4.16. We're going to input the character height. We're going to input, sorry, we're going to input the character. We're going to input the character height. And uh, basically, while counter is less than height, we're going to have an inner counter. While inner counter is less than or equal to counter, we're going to output the character. We're going to set the counter, and we're going to go back up to the top of the loop. Output a space, go back up to the top of the loop. And this can also be done with a for loop, by the way. It probably should be. 
Um, so this is generally, it's not a huge program. It's very tight. And it should be tight like this. There doesn't need to be a lot of extra stuff here. And then 4.17, even tighter code. So this is a while loop, and it should be a while loop. So while token of zero is not equal quit. So I'm putting in a bunch of words, which is why it's tokens of zero. And I'm going to input these words, and then I'm going to split them into a list like I did in one of the examples. And so I'm going to look at the first element in that list, and I'm going to make sure it's not equal to Q. If it is, I'm done. Because, sorry, it's not equal to quit, because quit is my sentinel value. So then I'm going to output eating tokens of zero, tokens of one, tokens of zero, day keeps the doctor away. And then I'm going to set, I'm going to ask the user, in this case, inside the for loop, to input a word and input and then split the words. And you'll notice that when I input a word, I set word that's the same variable as in the outer scope. I'm going to set tokens is, the, is splitting it. So if I, you know, have apple and day or, you know, apple and pear, that's what's going to get output. If I want to quit, or if Zybooks wants to quit, it's just going to type in the word quit and expect that this stops. So I know we've gone over a teeny bit. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Okay. You can also um, unmute. Yes. I had one question. Uh -huh. Okay, um, I'm trying to do the pseudocode for uh, the assignment, and one of the things that you have to do is like import random. So, what? How would you write that in pseudocode specifically? Because there isn't really like a import or whatever is one of the options from like the PDF, or can we just use import? You could use import. You could also not worry about import and just say create a random number. Okay. So that way it's still language agnostic. Um, okay. So, yeah, you can just say create a random number. So, right. um, sorry. Tom, yes. Um, it would be wise to use the dictionary for the room names and the item definitions and the directions. So there should be one other thing here, and that is where you, how you get there. How, how do you get when, when I'm, you know, in room one, and I type in north, where does that take me? So that should also be in this dictionary. No problem. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? And yes, it is appropriate now to start talking about the game because it's a lot of work and we're throwing a lot of stuff at you. So if you haven't started to look at the rubric for the game or the rubric for the dragon game that you do the week before, please look at them. And come, you can come here with questions, and I will do my best to answer those questions. And as we get closer, I am trying to incorporate things that are similar to what you would have to do in a game so that it is easier for you, like discussing tonight that, you know, a while, a while loop is your gameplay loop. That's what's going to start it. So please feel free to come with questions. Um, and I will be happy to answer them because the game is about putting it all together and some people get lost when they try and put it all together. They're really good at the pieces, but that bigger picture, and it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it takes time. It takes time to learn to think like that. So now that I've gone over by a few more minutes, anybody have any other questions? Going once. 
going twice. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to stop the meeting and this should be up sometime around noon tomorrow. I hope you all have a great evening and um, see you next week.